it's a game of fractions because you can go into a game feeling really good and really confident and not get a shot. Q Sports is one of the only things where you're sitting there in your chair while the other player's playing. That doesn't happen if you think of any other kind of sport. And obviously the two tournament wins after I last spoke to you. Obviously the game's so tough and to win any tournament's special. Rules the roost in Edinburgh. He is the Scottish Open champion for the second year running. You've got to have a, a sickening obsession with the sport. He thinks he thinks I cheated against him in, in the Scottish last year. I've got still got demons, you know, sort of playing wise and probably a load of battle scars as well. Mm -hmm. At least I've done things now. However I've got there and whatever I feel about that deep down and how I really feel I can play or I can't play or isn't as relevant, I guess, overall as at the end of the day, I'm 38 years old now. I've managed to win a few tournaments. I've managed to get myself into the top 16. Gary Wilson, for me, you, you're, in, you're in the top four all day for me. Do well at the game, perfect it, play well, be as good as you can be, do everything the right way. Snog Murray Pie. Snooker players. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are joined by pro snooker player Gary Wilson. Gary, how are you doing? I'm great, mate. How are you? Spot on, mate. It's been a while, obviously, since we did the last podcast. And I know we talked about, obviously, going into your life, how you got into snooker and all the rest of it. But since then, obviously, a lot's changed. First and foremost, you've been married. You've won the Scottish again. And then the Welsh. Um, how does all that, everything that you've won and been married, how has that changed you as a person over the last year? It hasn't. If I'm going to keep that answer short and sweet, it, 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 I don't really change as a person um, with anything, really. It's mm. it's obviously brilliant to have, obviously, as you say, getting married and then um, life's not really changed because of that because me and Robin had been together for like over 10 years, you know, so you kind of knew when we got married that nothing was really going to change. Um, so, yeah, that's amazing. Um, and obviously the two tournament wins after I last spoke to you Again, amazing. Um, never really thought the pair of them would come as close together as what they did. Obviously, the game's so tough and to win any tournament's special. So to get a couple again within like a couple of months of each other was absolutely fantastic, yeah. Did you do anything in your game differently, though? I know you said that you didn't expect them to come so close together. Is there anything that you, you know, did you tweak or change anything since the first Scottish? <sighs> All the time. Mm -hmm. um, nothing I can really sort of explain but like just chopping and changing all the time really like I have done for most of my career and maybe just took bits of what I did in the first Scottish when I, I sort of explained at the time that towards the end of that tournament I was almost in the giving up phase and then I just completely reverted to like natural instinct completely abandoned all my technique and everything and just totally played as much an instinct as I could mm -hmm. knowing that it wasn't going to work fully overall but that I had a chance of at least playing decent and as it turned out, I got through the semi-finals of that first Scottish in the final playing like very instinctively and it did kind of wear off as I thought after that in the next couple of tournaments and it was just like, I can't play like this, it's not solid enough, like I'm just missing easy balls left, right and centre but being able to flow at the same time when I'm in the balls and it's just like a very up and down kind of game. So I took bits of that into the second like Scottish that I won and the Welsh that I won as well where there was times I was struggling and I just thought, well, this has kind of worked before. Try it a bit. Maybe it'll just get you at least through this game. And then you, you can always go on the practice table in between matches after that. And you just go through thoughts like that, thinking, I just want to get through this one because I'm struggling. Give myself a bit of time to try and find something in the practice room. Hopefully come out in the next match and feel like I'm playing properly again. And you just go through a load of mix of emotions. And that's basically what I did for the them two tournaments. Um, especially the second Scottish, but more the Welsh, I actually found a bit more of my proper game and I was actually happier with that tournament win because I felt I played what I feel deep down as my sort of proper solid game. Um, didn't change anything most of the tournament really. Maybe from the second round I was doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, which is the way every player wants to play and feel comfortable, you know, because at the end of the day you don't want to keep chopping and changing all the time you want to you want to be happy with what you're doing and just get on with it so you can just focus on potting the balls what's happening guys i hope you're enjoying the episode so far if you are please hit that like hit the subscribe button and press the notification bell so you don't miss another episode i yeah. know that your mindset obviously over the years has been you know it's no secret you've been up and down with it and kind of like were you, you know, thinking about going back to the taxis again and then you're back on the tour and you're doing this and you've you've you know you've 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 worked the hard way 
to get to where you are. And again, congrats on, on where you are now, mate. It's unbelievable. To, to be from the northeast and watch someone like yourself do what you've done, not just in snooker, but outside the snooker world, like, actually, this is a lad who's did a normal job, grafted his arse off, and he's got to this position in life. And I think that's, that's for me personally, when I'm here, I'm like, I still get chills now when I think of that, because it's like, it just shows me what I can do, whether it be the podcast, whether it be the business, no matter what it is. So looking at someone like you as an example, I can only imagine how many other lads or girls around around the world who are watching someone like you and think, actually, there's a lad like that in my area as well. He's doing this. Why can't I? And I think that's what it is. It's like a beacon of hope, mate. And I, I want, again, I just want to say thank you for that because I, I do feel like there's a lot of lads now, especially with snooker and pool, obviously, it's massive. People are looking at people like yourself, you know, and thinking, what is possible? Maybe I'm going to get in the club more. Maybe I'm going to not stay on the streets more and do this and get myself focused and do something. Where, you know, you don't have to be world number one. You don't have to be world number 10. Um, but you can certainly do positive things by by taking up something like that. So again, may I cheese for that. With oh, your mindset. I just want to say I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, you never really know a lot of that and you never know what an impact you're going to make on anyone. But if you can do that, as you say, and it, that is happening, then I, as, a, as a player, as a person, I feel really grateful and sort of, you know, humbled to, to know that that's happening. So, yeah, cheers for that. I mean, he's an example, right? And I'll just, I'll just throw this at you. When I did the podcast with your last, one of the first things I did was went to my local club and played snooker myself. Right. And I'm horrendous. Like, I, I kind of pot. But it was just something I was like, I want to just do something and channel my energy into something. And whether it be, you know, it could be in the gym in the past or whatever it may have been. Like, that was a game where actually it's peace. I mean, I've just been down... um to the qualifiers and for the worlds there and uh when i was watching some of the lads go on i was like actually this is i understand when you're a player there's different kind of pressure and stress and it's not all peace but to be there and be part of the action and, and sort of observe what's going on it's quite a peaceful sport it definitely can be that as well so again whether you want to be a pro whether you want to do something in the sport or whether you want to just play coming for a knock is definitely gonna it can definitely help you even if it just means getting you know keeping yourself out of them distractions that you normally do in life with your mindset gary what did you change? Because you do seem like a more confident, more, you know, upbeat player now. I mean, you've always been a bit quirky, a bit of a character around the around the table. But has there been anything where you can remember where you think, actually, do you know what? That's definitely changed. Was it the fact that you've been married? Is it something as I understand it's not a big thing to you because obviously you've been together for that long. Yeah. Nothing's changed. But is it a fact that you feel like you're more settled person now? Is there anything else going on? I, I honestly think it's not like just some sort of switch has been flicked. It's not like some sort of just like change in any one thing. I think it's just a gradual change over the years of that same old cliche. It's like a mix of little things that all build into one, you know, mm -hmm. and as I say, I've gotten a bit older, I've gotten a bit wiser, I'm coincidentally doing a bit better, I'm getting a bit further up the rankings, I've won a few tournaments. However I've got there and whatever I feel about that deep down and how I really feel I can play or I can't play or isn't as relevant, I guess, overall as at the end of the day I'm 38 years old now I've managed to win a few tournaments I've managed to get myself into the top 16 and however much I still feel deep down I want to do more and I can show more and I can show people I can play better and that's that's the other part of us that's the mm -hmm. bit that's always going to be hungry and wants to show people what I can really do but the other side of it is now at least there if you know what I mean whereas in the past it wasn't so in the past I've been dealing with like I can't even show what I want to do can't even show how I'm playing, I'm not getting anything from it, I'm not enjoying it, and I'm nowhere, I'm sort of 32, 40 in the world, whatever it might be, um, not even in the top 16, I haven't won a tournament, I haven't done anything, so like you can easily sort of think about your career and go, um, what am I actually enjoying out of this, what am I doing, but at least the other half of that's there now, so I can chill a bit, do you know what yeah, I mean, that, I, I think that's... that's what it is, I can mm -hmm. chill a bit, even though I've got things that I still want to do, and as I say, I want to do more and play better, and I've got still got demons you know, sort of playing wise and probably a lot of battle scars as well. Mm -hmm. At least I've done things now. And I think that so, I think that just naturally has to chill you out as a person. If you can't be chilled by a bit of success and a, and doing pretty well in your sport, even though them things are there, as I say, then when are you ever gonna be sort of easy enough on yourself to get on with life and just be a bit more chilled and not be depressed, you know? So yeah, that's understandable. it gets easier, I suppose, the better you're doing. Have you brought anyone on board from a mental point of view? Uh, no, not really. I've, I've spoke to a couple of people before. Um, I think I've mentioned in previous interviews, um, there's a little bit of thanks got to go to Josh McLaren, mm -hmm. um, Steve's son. Um, I sort of spoke to him for a little while, a couple of years ago, um, just here and there. And he, he always said, you know, just come down, we'll have a coffee, we'll just have a chat for an hour and just 
just wanted to try and help us, you know, and obviously that was his area. He was doing a degree, I think, in sports psychology at the time and obviously he's doing wonders now with, um, I think he was doing it with the women's football team and stuff at Newcastle and that was that was what he wanted to do and I was kind of like his guinea pig in a way and just wanted to try and help us and just learn learn himself about the, the sort of position as well. And it did help a little bit, but it got to a point where I thought it's not really for me sort of consistently going forward. I feel like it's too hard to concentrate on everything that you're being told to try and think of and try and play the game at the same time. Yeah, for me, it just didn't work. It was Do you feel like, like you'd be learning from scratch a little bit? A, a little bit, and like you don't necessarily know whether it's any better. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't like a light bulb moment where I was like, I've been missing this. This is what I kind of need. It wasn't like that. It was just I'm being told to do something totally different mentally now, which makes sense, but doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to play any better. It's, it's if anything, I felt it was probably going to hinder us on the table because I'm trying to think of these thoughts when I'm not even focusing on the game. You can energy I'm, to other things. Yeah, and I think right. I'm best when I just. I think I'm quite deep down, level-headed and, and strong enough in the head when I'm when things are working and I feel happy in my game. I think I'm good enough in that department to deal with stuff. Yeah. So I didn't really find it was gonna gonna help us as such. Maybe just do something different. Uh, but I guess I guess the real test of character is when things aren't going well and how you deal with them, isn't it? For obviously, you know how good you are. The world can say how good you are. Um, and no matter what I think, I think you should be higher up than rankings and where you are. I think that you you definitely could have did more, personally. Although that's not discrediting everything you've done. I just feel like Gary Wilson for me, you you're in the, you're in the top four all day for me. Um, in the way, and I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting down with you, mate. I genuinely believe that. And yeah. <laughs> w- no, no, genuinely, mate. I'm, no, I'm, I mean that honestly. Um, Again, it's like the certain players that I'll go and like to watch. You're one of them. You're someone who I'll sit and I, I'll, I, I didn't watch a lot of snooker. I find a lot of it boring. But when I'm watching it, if it's someone like yourself, uh, it's, it's like watching Chelsea Man U or something. You know, if you're watching one of the one of them players, obviously there's a few players that I like to watch and you're one of them. For obviously winning the Scottish batter back and then going on the Welsh and stuff, not many players have done that with the Scottish. Did that solidify in your mind how good you actually are? Again, I try not to be hard on myself and I'm I'm trying to learn more and more not to like keep putting myself down, but I have to be honest and I have to say again, like because I didn't feel brilliant in them tournaments, I didn't do it the way you dream of doing it as a mm. kid. And yes, I know I know deep down I'm a good player. I'm may- maybe one of the top players in the game to an extent. I know that obviously deep down. I'm not sort of showing that. You know, if I was looking at me as an outsider, I would go like looking critically at it as a like from a player's point of view, I would go, What what are you though? What are you all about? Like, I mean, I'm watching you win a few tournaments, but you're not really doing it to the level of like the top, top players. You're not re I would look at it like that, you know, that's yeah. just me. And I try obviously to look at myself like that as well because I'm a I'm a competitor, I'm a player. I know how to look at people and go, You're a proper player or you're just someone who's nicked a few. Now, I'm not saying I've just nicked a few. As I say, I believe deep down I'm capable of being like a top player. But I know it's not, I know I'm not showing that yet to people. I'm not showing that sort of really strong performance a number of times to go, wow, he's like, he's a top, top player. I'm waiting for that. So it's hard for me to sort of not discredit myself at the same time. I've done the Scottish in like a, a different way. I didn't do it the way you would want to, where I've just blown everyone away and went, wow, what a performance. You know, similar to maybe like when, Sean Murphy kind of won the world championships mm-hmm. and you were like, wow, like the way he's, the way he's done that, like you can tell he's a top, top player. He, he potted long balls for fun all tournament and just done it in a way where you thought, yeah, you can see how he's going to be a top player for many years. I've been sort of lingering around for a lot of years and then I've nicked a few and it's coming out a little bit, but it's not there yet. So yeah, without trying to be harsh on myself, there's more hope, hopefully to come. I think you've definitely been a bit harsh. I mean, maybe <laughs> maximum in, in them, you know, getting a maximum in them pressurising situations, mate. <clears throat> I yeah, mean, they're the glimpses I'm talking about, though, you see. Yeah. But, but if that's not doing that at the top level, what is? No, that is. That is doing it at the top level. I just want more of it. I'm not saying I want it all the time. You can't do that all the time. But I think similar, there was, a, there was an interview Ronnie gave the other day. I think it was actually when he beat me. In the last few frames he won, he went on a bit of a burst. Up until then, to be totally honest, from a purist's point of view, it was a decent game. It was a good game to watch, mm-hmm. but there wasn't a lot of strong snooker. 
And then, unfortunately for me, it's 7-7, he went on a bit of a burst. And now he says, I used to do that 60-70% of the games. Yeah. You know, like, that's that was... And I don't know if I believe that. I think he still does that 60-70% of the games. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point being that I want to do that because I know I'm capable of doing that. I want to play like I did against, say, John Higgins in the semi of the Welsh. I want to play like that at least half the time. Because yeah. that wasn't a super performance from me. That was That was a couple of great frames. And a few good solid frames and you know a bit of pressure at the end it, it had the the makings of like a, a good a really good match from my perspective but a really good match from my perspective i know i'm capable of half the time and i'm feeling i'm probably only doing it maybe 15 20 percent of the time you know it's and, a, it's and a the, funny rest, sport. the rest of it's just solid you know it's a funny sport though because you look at someone like ronnie you know when he just beat you there and you look at you can tell he's got a lot of respect for you um i mean i've watched quite a few bits and pieces of ronnie um, over the years, and he's always he's always spoke highly of you. To be fair, uh, certainly recently, and I think when you're someone like him, who you know, he's again no secret that a lot of mental health, a lot of demons creeping in, gets stage fright, doesn't it, turn up to tournaments and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you understand that? Do do you do you ever yeah. experience anything Absolutely. like that? Absolutely. Do you know? What? Out of out of, and I'm not just saying this. People will tell you who are close to us when I speak about it here and there. Um, I understand what Ronnie's saying a lot, a yeah. lot. Like I get, I get where he's coming from. I, I get to an extent without knowing, obviously, because you don't know what's going on in anyone's head. But I feel like I get what he's doing, and I get where he's coming from. And, and the answers that he gives at times, I get, where, I get what place they're coming from. I, we're doing the same sport, and essentially, we're probably thinking very similar things to a to a similar level, you know. And yeah, I, I relate to a lot of how he is and what he says and. I feel like I understand it and it's sort of in a way that actually feels good mm-hmm. in a silly kind of way. It feels like, you know, I feel like I'm on the same wavelength, so I can't be doing too much wrong. But at the same time, you've got to be careful because he'll know himself. Some of the things he's done over the years and said, and it's to his detriment or it's, it's not ideal. And I know that as well, but I think we're quite similar personalities as well. We just say what we want and say what we feel and be honest about stuff. Yeah. But I think, I think that not being ideal is what, makes the character do Maybe. you know what i mean i yeah, think yeah. anyone at you know in an elite level you know position you've got to have a a sickening obsession with the sport or to to be the best and i think that is always going to carry an imbalance in it i think that's you've touched on a great point there i think that's generally what it boils down to if, if this is making no sense to anyone mm-hmm. that's generally what it kind of boils down to i think it's like it's the obsession with just wanting to do well at the game perfect it play well be as good as you can be, do everything the right way. It's all that kind of thing, you know, and you you don't do things the right way because of it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, life's tough, isn't it? And your emotions take over at times. And I think it's that fact, though, of just trying to get to a point where you can accept it. Ronnie's sort of doing that now in his later years. He's accepting that he can't be unbelievable all the time. I know he's touched on saying about me that I maybe need to accept that you can't play well all the time. I know that, but I think I can play better than what I'm showing people. Maybe people think they know what I'm capable of, and I maybe think I'm capable of a little bit more than that. I don't know. Who knows? But at the end of the day, we're trying. We're we're getting there. And if I keep going up, that's what I was touching on earlier. If I keep going up in the rankings and I'm doing all right and winning tournaments, you've got to give yourself some credit. You've got to give yourself a bit of like a boost and say, look, I'm doing all right here because... Yeah, I'm not where I want to be game wise, showing people wise, you wonder what you can do, but I'm still doing better than a lot. So come on, give yourself a bit of credit, give yourself a bit of confidence. And it does, it gives you a bit of natural confidence just going into games, knowing that you're doing well. <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. You're doing well. You might not be playing great, but you can still win. But I think I think I think that's exactly what we've both just touched on there. Like that is what makes someone great, though, regardless of your position. It's it's like doing the podcast, mate, right? The amount of detail that I put into the podcast, people wouldn't even understand, even from a traveling a thousand miles away, getting all the guests lined up, never missing a week, making sure you turn up, you're putting the reels out, you're on TikTok, you're on Instagram, you're on social, you, you're literally everywhere trying to be the best. And this is why I've actually sloganed the podcast the most underrated show in the world, because I genuinely believe that, you know, I feel like I'm sitting down with one of the best snooker players in the world. And I know that the podcast not getting the, it's not going to get the recognition that it deserves. Right. Yeah. And I know that how many people can be helped by listening to someone like yourself. You've been there. You've done it from taxis to the table. You've do, you've you've literally done it. Yeah. And you're still climbing. You, you know you haven't come from money. 
and then you're starting to make money. You're starting to do these fancy things, you know, whether, whether it is, you know, getting married to the girl of your dreams, traveling the world, buying nice cars, treating yourself. It's not all about materialism, but it's about giving yourself that personal develop, like that growth all the time. Yeah. You're actually doing it. And again, this is what I'm trying to do. When, when I'm speaking to people, I want to speak to people who've done something in that field. Yeah. And I feel like we've got to help other people understand that if they're having a shit time or a shit day or things are not going the way they want, they can tune into a podcast or yeah, they can, yeah. you know what, actually, I'm going to go and do that thing. It doesn't have to be snooker, it doesn't have to be boxing, it doesn't have to be the gym. It can be just something. Something to inspire you a little bit kind of thing, yeah. And it's tough because if I was obviously listening to something like myself, it, it can be probably hard to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're trying to look for maybe a bit of inspiration of somebody and, and all that. And when you're talking about a game and the specifics and it can, so I try not to be too like, hard to understand if you know what I mean I try I try to sort of explain it in a way that people can get because people might watch this as you say or listen to this and not actually play snooker but they just want a sports mentality sort of side from it and it's tough because you could go what does he mean there I don't I don't really mean and you don't really probably understand a lot of it until you're doing it yourself that's experience isn't it yeah of course so it, for me it, it these these kinds of things are absolutely brilliant because, as you say, they inspire people. They, mm -hmm. they can do anyway, and I hope I'm inspiring someone. 100%. Um, 100%. And I'm, I'm sure I try, I try, that's why I try to keep everything as real as I can, as honest as I can, mm -hmm. because there's no better way, as, as far as I'm concerned, in life. Keep it honest, keep it real. If someone can understand what you're talking about and get it and take something from it, then that's the goal, really, I suppose, of these kinds of things. And I know it's not all about, well, I guess it is in a way about winning trophies and silverware and, and, and all the nice things that come with that. I want to talk about that because I feel like, again, as much as we want to inspire someone, we also want to show people what is possible. And I feel like because, again, you know, what, you, what you've done in the last season, I imagine financially things have changed for you for the better. Um, well, I know they will have, but how much has that changed and how much does that ease your mind and how much does that put you in a position where you think, you know, actually, I don't have to worry as much now. You know, the the the, the, the idea of going back on the taxis is probably not a, not a thing I'm going to be looking at now. Or well, is that something you keep there, keep the fire in your ass? you know what I mean? To be yeah, like, actually... Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was probably... That was probably more like sort of five, six years ago, I would say, where mm -hmm. the, the security was there to go, look, we know like a hundred percent now, maybe a little bit longer even. We know a hundred percent now you're not gonna be worrying, you're gonna be you're gonna be a professional snooker player unless something drastic happens and you're gonna be able to make a living and not worry about that side of things. I guess in the last few years it's it's turned into more of like right, we can like start ticking the boxes you wanna tick off in life, you know, like get your house paid for, get a nice car, get you know, all the things yeah, that you yeah. want when you you're doing better, you know, and that's basically what I'm doing now. I'm sort of ticking the boxes off and just trying to be boring, boring as anything, but just be sensible about stuff and just, I'm, I've never, I think because of, and I think I touched on this before, maybe while last podcast, I've never been one to sort of take anything for granted because of the, because of the life I had mm -hmm. in the earlier years where I was skint all the time and scrapping for every penny just to go to tournaments and all that kind of thing. It's, it's hard for us to shake that off to an extent and just yeah. be like, ah, we'll just fling 20 grand here and 20 grand. I can't do it. I just can't do it. I can treat myself. I can I can spend money. I can do what I want on things that I want. Um, I spend money on the things I like. I'll happily spend money on the missus, on anything she wants, all that kind of thing. Not a problem, but I'll not just go throwing, throwing money away. And, and uh, I'm at well, the position now where I've got enough to sort of go, I could throw money away, but I'm actually going to be sensible about it and start thinking of things like pensions because we're in a kind of sport where you're self-employed at the end of the day and you never know what's going to happen. And yeah, just very sensible about it, really. I think what's testament to what you've just said, obviously people who you know, are listening or watching are not going to say what I've just seen in the car park up there. <laughs> well, that's just, an example. <laughs> uh, just what you've done over the last few months and you've bought yourself a, a smart car. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What was your reason for buying a smart car? Yeah, so... Um... Obviously, like I said before, I've, I've got a nice car. I've got a lovely BMW M340. So it's not like I'm just rolling around in a smart car. I've got a lovely car for up and down the country, going all over the place. But at the end of the day, I was thinking, why am I running that big, lovely car all around the doors over speed bumps and things and just wasting mileage on it, parking it up near the club where people can ding your door and all sorts. And I thought, I don't need to. Why, why don't I just get a, like, a cheap little run around just for going around the doors and throwing it over speed bumps and round corners and just you know it's parking it anywhere you want because it's tiny and I thought well what better thing to get than a smart car and it just progressed into like seeing a couple of ads online and stuff and then 
I was like, oh, there's a convertible one as well. So I'll get one of them because that's quirky as out. If in the summer down the coast and that, just get the roof down, me quirky little smart car. Tell them what colour it is. And yeah, and then I seen this ad and this guy, James, um, down Cheltenham way. So that's a good four hours from me as well. He had a green wrap on his smart car and green's my favourite colour. So when I seen it and he had the black wheels and stuff as well and like sort of black styling on it and it was a cabriolet, uh, the roof down and that as well. And I thought, wow, that's perfect. As long as everything else adds up, I'm going for this. And it was reasonable mileage and, you know, it wasn't too bad a price. And I thought, right, I'm going to get it. And I just thought it's absolutely ideal. So the small, I just took it back last night, uh, four hours up the road. <laughs> and um, yeah, as you've seen, I'm com coming in this morning. And it's just going to be an ideal little run around just to go back and forwards with and round the doors and stuff. And it just, it's quirky as anything. So yeah, I, I like to spend my money on things that I'll enjoy. And I certainly enjoyed that last night driving that home. And I think <laughs> that, that's what I mean though. That is testament to you. It's like, it's like, that's what I love about people like yourself. It's like salt the earth. I don't know if it's a northeast thing, but it's like you can do all these things in the sport and you can do whatever and you can, you know, you can gain financially and stuff, but then you still gonna opt to get the smart car because you want to put the mileage in your other car and you know you just it's it's practical living, isn't it? It's practical, yeah. As you I say, mean, it's how many other waste. players at your level are doing stuff like that? I'm assuming <laughs> you know the splurging all over the place, they're in Dubai non-stop, they're doing this, that, and the other. And I feel like that just goes back to how you are as a character, where you're from, how it all began. Um, and the fact that, you know, you've never had to you don't have to do things like that. Yeah. There's don't nothing get us wrong. wrong. I will, and I want to, mm -hmm. and I'm going to. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'll go on holidays as soon as I get the opportunity. We'll go to Dubai or whatever. We'll, we'll do all the nice things we want to do to enjoy our life just without going daft and wasting all your money. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And at the end of the day, a little quirky thing like that, that's just me, as you say. That's my character. If I spot something and I put my mind on something, and cars, cars and sort of gaming stuff, you know, and they're, they're the things I'll spend my money on. And I'm not bothered about anything else other mm -hmm. than going out with my mates for drinks and stuff and mm -hmm. holidays, as I say. Other than that, I'm not I'm not fussed at all the material things in life, really. Mm -hmm. And that's just a quirky little thing that have I'll you, just enjoy. Eh? Have you tricked yourself other than that over the last year? Yeah. Well, other than the smart car. Oh. <laughs> as I say, the, the new car, the BM, the mm -hmm. M340. Mm -hmm. Lovely car, brand new. Yeah, absolutely love it. It's my favourite car. Um, the game and stuff, as I say, like... Um, People probably know by now, I, I play a bit of sort of sim racing. I've got like a little rig in the house. I've got like an 85-inch TV and a rig set up in front of it. And I've got like some new um, Fanatec peripherals. So I've got like the steering wheel, which is like a GT2 BMW like replica wheel. screen and all? Gone round? No, it's not like a curved screen set oh, right, up or right. anything like that. I've got like a, it's basically what you would call like a converted garage. I've got an extension on the house. So what you would imagine would be a garage space on the back wall. I've just got a big 85-inch TV. It's all like a converted room. It's like a cinema room kind right, of thing. Right, I see. Um, so I've got an 85-inch TV on the wall, and in front of that I've got like me, me rig, where I've got me, me pedals and me gear stick, handbrake, steering wheel. As I say, the steering wheel is like a proper replica of a racing BMW GT2 car, you know, yeah, so it's wow. like great little setup, and I haven't had a chance to really play on it much, but I'm hoping when the season's finished to put in a few hours because... That's my other little hobby, you know. I love a bit of sim racing. I'd love, I love to go go karting whenever I've got the opportunity. Um, just recently, we've gotten offers through social um, soapbox to um, like do extra things. They've got sort of a deal with World Snooker where they can help promote you and help do things here and there. And they've, they've asked us if I would be interested in any anything like that. And I says anything to do with rallying, you know, WRC or F1 or the British Touring Car Championship, any of, the, any of them sorts of things I've always been a fan of growing up mm -hmm. and they've started getting us involved in like, oh, you might be able to go to like a track day or you might be able to go see this rally team in somewhere. And so these things are starting off now and obviously that's just down to I'm doing a bit better and I've got a bit more of a profile and the opportunity to do anything like that, I'm, I'm up for. So anyone that wants to take us to the racetrack <laughs> or out like that, happy days. <laughs> Bring your smart car. <laughs> yeah. I, feel like, I feel like you'd have invested in things like that anyway, even if you didn't have the money. I feel yeah. like you'd have always been interested in trying to get a little rig in your house or something set up. Well, I did. So, so and yeah. that's what I mean. So, I feel like even that's not really shown that you've tread yourself. Yeah, I know yeah. you've got a nice car, but but I mean, other than that, is there anything where you've you know it, it's mad to see that? No, nah, I mean, what what else would you treat yourself on? Do you know what I mean? I, I know. It it just comes down to the boring, really expensive stuff, you know, like getting a getting a massive house, and you know. I, we're, we're happy where we live. I love where I live. Mm -hmm. me, 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 Mrs. Robin, she loves Wall's End as well. Where, where we are is fine. Don't get us wrong. Like, there may, ta there may come a time where if I'm still doing well, we'd get our final, final house. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But up to now, we're really happy. There's only the two of us. Um, 
we don't need anything. Does it come into your mind when you're playing? Do you think, actually, if I do well here, maybe other things are possible? Or do you just think, no, nah, happy where I we are? I think, to be it. honest, that's probably actually helped me in the, in the respect that I'm not chasing money. Mm-hmm. I'm not sort yeah. of looking for like that massive paycheck where I can go, God, if I get this, I can pay for this and I can get that and I can pay this off. And it's just gradually happened over the years where I've been able to sort of pay the house off and get a nice car. And then, you know, you get to a point where you're comfortable now, where you're just happy with everything. I don't need to chase another massive paycheck to go, well, I can get that and I can get that. And I'm not like that at all. I'm happy with what I'm doing and where I am at the moment. If you don't know by now, I run a business called The Content PT. I create content for influencers, PTs, online coaches, and fitness brands all around the world. So if you are someone who's in need for sexy content for your social media, or you really want to maintain a competitive edge in your industry, drop me a DM on Instagram. Do you think you're a one-off in that respect? Do you, do, you fit, do you find that a lot of people who want to get on the tour and stuff are chasing money? Or do you think people are purely, you know, the one silverware, the one, almost a legacy, they want to leave something behind, they want the name on their trophies, they want that? Or do you think it is for a money thing as well? I, I think it's a mix. I don't think yeah. it's a one-off at all. I think it's a mix. I, I know sort of, kind of for a fact, when you're speaking to other players and you see other players, um, more more so obviously the top players which is easy to say when you're already there but I know there's players in the past maybe like Sir Ronnie and stuff who've never really pl- pay- played for the money they've mm-hmm. maybe had money there anyway and comfortable mm-hmm. but there is players who aren't playing for the money they're honestly playing for titles probably like a Mark Selby and stuff as well I know he sort of grew up in a council estate didn't have a lot of money but it wasn't about the money as well mm-hmm. it was about making yourself comfortable yes and making yourself earn a living and that's what you want to do but I think a lot of players are literally just that. They just want to get to a point, like myself, where it was like, this is what I do, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to make me living. Anything after that's a bonus. I'm yeah, not chasing millions, I'm <clears throat> chasing a living. And that's, I think, a lot of players. But yeah, you maybe get the other players who are just dreaming of the success mm-hmm. in terms of the money side of it. They want to have a rich lifestyle and all that kind of thing, maybe. Does it... Does it- Kill the hunger a bit when you when you do better. I know that sounds mad because I feel like obviously the better you do, the closer you are to bigger goals and yeah. bigger things. I'm I'm not talking about financial. I just mean in general. Does it kill the hunger? Because for me in business, if if my business is going really well, I feel like I've got that much hunger in us. I don't want to stop anywhere. I think that's just me character. But at the same time, when if there's a certain deal that I get or a certain contract with a certain company or brand or whatever, I feel like actually you know what we can chill for a little bit. And I know that's the wrong thing to do. The overall hunger is still there. But on that, on the, on the now, on the yeah, thing, on yeah. that time, I'm a little bit like actually we can relax. I a think bit. that's totally natural, and I think anyone, including myself, goes through that to an extent. Um, as you say, like you, you get to a point where, but I think it's sensible. You get to a point where you're thinking, I don't need that, mm. but right, what do I not need it or want it for? And you, you just try and be sensible about about it. Like maybe I'm getting off at exhibitions now here and there and everywhere that maybe if I wasn't doing very well, I would have jumped at the chance to go and do and get yeah. a bit extra money and stuff. I don't need to do that now. So part of your business model to an extent has got to be like, well, where am I at? What's my worth? What 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 do, what do I, what am I going to gain out of it? Yeah, and of I don't think that's been, it sounds a bit snobby and a bit, you know, whatever, but it's not really. It's just like, no, look, I've got to look after myself as well. If I'm going to be putting my time into this, that, and the other, I need to make sure I'm putting my time into the into the things that are really, really important. Like for me, the big to- the biggest tournament in the world coming up around the corner yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and it's not being snobby. It's just about segregating your time to what you're worth and what you feel you need. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And it's very, very natural to do. Yeah. I think ultimately that's the position. You you know you've got to be selfish. Yeah. You've got to be because ultimately, be. like you are looking after yourself. Time's you, precious, and there's not a lot of it, is there? So. Do you want yeah. kids? Uh, no, I don't think we do. Do you not? So no. Has we, ever been a proper conversation? Or yeah, just... we, we we've had conversations. Me and Robin for quite a few years. You know, I mean, I'm 38 now, so. Mm-hmm. It would get to the point where we're going to have to do it pretty soonish. Um, mm-hmm. But I've never really fancied it deep down. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're happy enough to get the nieces and nephews round and sort of palm them back off again and go, yeah, thank yeah. you very much kind of thing. But no, just I'm, I've, I've just never been, never ever really. Like even when I was in my 20s and, you know, you start seeing your mates maybe start having kids and things like that and you're like, I just don't really think I want to be doing that. And yeah, it's just a, there's, there's people who are the same as me. It's a life choice, isn't it? Where... You just think it's not if it's not for me, it's not for me. That's and fair enough, obviously fair. making sure with Robin as well. Like, yeah, look, yeah. if it is for you, tell us. You know, like I'm not saying I, w- I definitely won't. I'm just saying I don't think I fancy it, kind of thing. Yeah, of course. And we've had the conversations, and she's she would tell us she's openly agreed and said, look, you know, obviously 
at first, I think years ago, she would have probably wanted to, and she's just slowly sort of changed her mind over the years, and she's got to a point where she's the same on the same wavelength as me, really, where she's like, nah, it's, I'm not, I'm not really bothered. Like, I'm happy enough to have the game, the nieces and nephews around and stuff, and we don't really feel the need to have kids. If you, yeah. if you feel the need and it's there inside you all the time, then obviously it's the right thing. But for us, that's just not there. Um, so yeah, it, it'll just be a case of me and her, I think. And yeah. we, we know we've had these conversations as well. We know we can just enjoy our life. We yeah, exactly. you know that the upsides to it all is obviously you can enjoy yourself. You can do what you want. And I lead a kind of lifestyle, obviously at the moment, being a professional snooker player where you're away quite a lot and, not that that stops you having kids, I know that, but it means that when I am and if we are doing well, we can enjoy our life. We can do things we want to do when we want to do them. And so that's the sort of route we're kind of thinking and taking now is yeah, enjoy our life, go where we want to go, do what we want to do, you know, and just... As long as, as, long as it keeps you happy, that's all yeah, that matters. Yeah, we anyway, could have 10, 15 years of, you know, great memories and great things to do, hopefully. So, yeah, there'll be no regrets from my side not having kids. So, and I'm, I'm sure Robin's in the same boat from the discussions we've had. So how much of your career do you think has impacted that decision? Or do you um, think it's genuinely just a mutual thing it's regardless obviously, of snooker? Yeah, it's obviously something you think about because <clears throat> you go you go to yourself like, well, would my career have been harder than it is now and would I have done as well if I'd had kids? Because obviously there's a lot of time being spent with your kids then and the pressures of it all. And Or would it have been any different? You know, there's there's plenty of players who've got kids, obviously, and they've had a great career. Mm-hmm. Or would it have helped us? You, you don't really know until you do it, I guess, what, what way it would have went. Obviously, I would have had less time to practice, but some say that's helped them. You know, they've yeah. maybe thought they've been putting in too many hours and trying too hard, so you never it's, really know, It's I a guess. tricky one, Gary, because I know, like, I've got a little and two and a half year old years, and uh, I have to say a half, because what you keep saying. But uh, I used to work hard before that, and I thought, I'm literally my own boss, I'm, I'm going for it. Kids, you know, it might change how I think of things. I want to be at home more. I want to do this. I want to do that, which of course I do. But it makes you work. Well, it has for me. It certainly made me work on another, I operate on another level now. Right. And I feel like that's kind of, you know, you can take it one or two ways. And I feel like if you're already setting your way like yourself, like, no, this is what I'm doing. This is my life and I'm happy. Yeah. Then, then stick, I would say stick with that decision. I mean, you never say never. You never know what yeah, happen yeah. around the corner. But ultimately, mate, I think that's, it's always the right thing to do whatever you do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think yeah. It, it, Whatever feels right has to be right. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, well, you don't know about it, do you? So what yeah. can you do? You can only, you can only do what you think feels right and what is right in yourself. And as I say, we both feel that way. And we've both said we feel that way, so we're just going to crack on and see what happens, yeah. I was travelling around Bali on that. That was amazing. Um, okay. Yeah, it was obviously like a, a, a prolonged honeymoon. Um, mm-hmm. We'd done Bali in the Maldives, so that was absolutely fantastic. Done all sorts of things you wouldn't normally do, obviously, in a normal holiday, like mm-hmm. washing ele- elephants with mud and all sorts and that, all <laughs> that class, kind of thing. Ah, yeah, it's crazy, crazy place, and the Maldives was just obviously totally different, just relaxing and... Yeah, what a place that is, by the way. I mean, she, I know she'd love to go back one day, and so would I. It was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. So, yeah, I'd love to go back sometime. Speaking earlier on when we were talking about, do you feel solidified um, in the sport? When you are doing those things like going to Bali or going on holiday, or just not, when you're not genuinely not round the table, do you like to not think about snooker? Because I imagine when you were coming up into the game, you had to be obsessed on yeah. any level, like always play when you can. Yeah, yeah. Now do you give yourself like actually no snooker for this period of time? I always have. And that's one thing I've never really changed is that, as you say, because I'm so kind of probably as obsessed by the game in the sense that it's my job and I want to do as best I can for myself and all that, all that kind of thing when I'm doing it. I've always been the same character that when I'm not doing it and I'm away from it, like on holiday and things like that, I just don't want to talk about it. I don't mm. want... I, I, listen, don't get us wrong. I love I love it when people come up to us now and say, "Oh, Gary, I, uh, you know, take a photo or whatever, have an autograph, or you, know, you might meet someone in a random pub." In the you know, but what I don't want to do is talk for like five ten minutes about snooker. Yeah, it's the last thing I want to do, and it's not in again in a horrible way. I know they just want to know a little bit of information and just like have a bit of chat with you. And naturally, I'd probably be the same. You know, you go up to someone that you you like or you've seen on the TV, and the first thing you think of talking about is the stuff that they do. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But there's a little bit of gotta be like, well, he does it all the time. He's probably like in his own brain sick of thinking about how he can improve himself and do better and and practicing every day and tournaments. And then when he comes away for a beer or he's going to a concert or he's walking down the street or whatever it may be, you don't really want to talk about snooker. You just want to live a normal life and talk about all sorts of random stuff that your mates talk about, you know? So that's, that's always been me. Yeah. 
Has it changed from a fame point of view? Because everybody knows you now. Would do you, do you get anxiety? Like I can only imagine. Do you get anxiety at the thought of going into a? I mean, you probably don't do it, but going into a local snooker club now, knowing that people, everyone's going to know you. No, because as much as I've made that sound probably a bit horrible in that I don't want to speak to people about snooker, I love speaking to people. I'm a proper yeah. open character. Not so much maybe, and again, that's where my split personality is on the tour and in and around tournaments and practice and here and stuff. I'm I'm a certain kind of like serious, like not talking too much kind of personality. Take us away from this game though, and I'm absolutely the opposite. I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of a character and I'll talk about anything and do all sorts of daft things and... So that's why when speaking to people, I'm actually like, actually quite enjoy it because I quite enjoy speaking to people about, as long as it's about all sorts of random things. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't want to hear the same old boring questions, you know, like, oh, how are you playing? Well, how do I answer that? Like, uh, do you know yeah, what I mean? I like, mean? But I think that's why the last podcast we did did so well because we didn't really talk about snooker. Obviously, in this one, obviously, you've got the world's coming up. It's literally right around the corner. Yeah. How do you fancy yourself for that? They see what I mean? There's one of them boring questions again. Oh, we're going, man. Do you know what I mean, though? <laughs> no, but how do you fancy yourself for it? Answer, answer the question. How do you fancy yourself I'll try, that? but like, this is why it's so hard, because it's, it's so... It, the, the, the questions that you can't really answer. <laughs> yeah. Because... You fancied yourself all the way. Well, I'll, I'll always fancy myself as long as I'm playing good and I'm feeling good. So mm -hmm. it'll be about coming into that tournament thinking, right, am I, am I playing decent in practice in my own head? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I feeling confident in what I'm doing in my technique? Am I feeling like I'm ready? Yeah. And yeah, so it's sort of like <laughs> maybe, maybe ask questions. us like maybe ask us like half an hour before I go play my match and I'd be right. able to give you a better answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd be totally honest with you and I'd go struggling. This is going to be hard work. I could still win, but struggling badly here yeah. or I could go feeling all right. And feeling all right would mean he fancies it. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's just really hard to answer that how do you fancy the world's going? Well, I could get pumped first round. Mm -hmm. Or I could go on to the semis like I did five years ago. Obviously, I'm hoping I go and win the whole thing. Do you know what I mean? But I never really know anything in between. I don't really know what's going to happen. It's all going to be the old boring cliche of how you feel on the day. Do you know what day. does my head in about snooker, right? You look at someone like yourself and you can, I mean, you can beat anyone, right? And I get it's over consistency over time to be the number one and all the rest of it, which everyone's chasing. But you know, like in boxing, Let's say you've got two fighters and you've got fighter A and he's pummeled fighter B. You, you, it's clear who's better. With snooker, it's never clear. I, again, I get it from a consistency point of view, but like you know you can beat Ronnie. Mm -hmm. But then it's having that like, that's what would frustrate me the most. Like when, when you don't win, you know you've beat him multiple times. It's not just like, well, I've beat him on the odd frame. So it, it's stuff like that, which I feel like that's where the frustration would come from. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Kind of, yeah, because mm -hmm. it's a game of fractions. And the reason why it's hard for us, like I said before, to give a proper answer is because you can go into a game feeling really good and really confident and not get a shot. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of sport. It's one, Q sport is one of the only things where you're sitting there in your chair while the other player's playing. That doesn't happen if you think of any other kind of sport. Mm -hmm. You get your shot. I might not get my shot. I might come into that game feeling the best I've felt in six years. And then sit in my chair after I've broke off and go, well, I'm 1-0 down now. Yeah, true. How ridiculous is that? It's, you know, in a way, and it's like, so I could win. I could beat like Sir Ronnie or whoever it may be, 5-2 or 5-3 or whatever it is. He could beat me 5-0, 5-1. And it, it could feel generally the same in both matches. You know, you, you, let's say I play another top player 10 times in 10 matches and I win eight of their matches and he only wins two. I could I could feel anything from not great to very good, and it could swing either way. You would never know which way it was because that's just that's just the game. Sometimes you've yeah. got to play solid to be consistent. That's the only way I would kind of put it. Where if you if I'm going to answer your question that you said before, and and you said how would you fancy the world this year? If I'd felt like I was playing consistently good for a year, I would go I fancy it. Like that would be the time when I would go I fancy it now, yeah. like because I've proved it to myself. I've played a whole year's worth of snooker and felt like good every single time. And yeah, I might get beat, like I've just said before, because that's the game. I could get beat in a few tournaments, and but I felt good. And you can go on to the next one and go, it's all right. I feel decent about my game. We can crack on. It's it's such so much easier for the mind yeah, to then just go. I can move on because I know I feel all right. Mad question: What would you rather lose and feel amazing? A win, struggling all the way. 
now that I'm 38 and I've had the, the many years of torture that I've had in battle scars, now I'd rather win and feel horrible. Would you? Because I've done that anyway, so I'm used to that. Right, so yeah, I, I get <laughs> what you mean. If I if I was younger, you know, if I was what I wanted to be when I was coming through, when I was 18, 19, 20 year old again, I'd want to be one of them. At least to start with, it was like me games there, me games there, me games there. I'm feeling amazing, but I'm just not winning. Oh, maybe I've got a couple of little things to learn. I'd rather be that because then at least if you learn that and you can just be like the all round player after that, you've got loads of years to win. I ain't got a lot of years to win now. I've got. Still plenty in the tank, hopefully. I'm hoping to play till I'm 50, you know. Oh, at least, at least oh. I, if I can. I want to play as long as I can. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still plenty of years there, but there's a lot of battle, battle scars. There's a lot of years I've sort of not done as well as I would have liked to have done. Hopefully it's coming. They're the positives. Hopefully it's just later rather than never. So I'd rather just win now. Yeah. I don't want to talk about weaknesses as such, mm -hmm. but is there anyone, any player in particular that you fear playing? No. No, because no. it, again, it's not about the player in this sport. It's a, it's a weird sport. It's not about who you're playing. It's just about what you do and how you control that table, really. Because you're playing against yourself, aren't you? It's, it's very, yeah. very. I always akin it to chess. It is. Do, do you? How how do you find playing people like Slatter? In terms of just how do you mentally and stuff? You know that obviously plays in the same club as you and yeah, stuff, yeah. and and you obviously you know him off the table. How does that feel when you when you beat him and and all that type of stuff? Is it almost like a a blessing and a curse because you're beating your mate and you're stopping him from progressing in his life. You've, you've got to not think about it that way. Um, you've got to just basically get on get on with it. And I've always done that. I've always just tried to be very level-headed and calm about all of that, sort of, like emotionless about all that sort of stuff. Again, like I said before, I'm a different personality away from the table than I am on the table. Yeah. And when it comes to me playing on the table, right, that's all about me to be selfish. That's all about for me just to do what I need to do and not in any kind of bad way, forget about whoever it is I'm playing. It doesn't matter. Like It's almost like a, I wouldn't say split personality, but it's when you're in that mode, it's, I listened to an interview recently with uh, Alex Reid, another mm -hmm. cage fighter. Yeah. And uh, obviously he's a cross-dresser and stuff and he's done all that and he's passed, but then on the t on, on, in, in the octagon, he's an absolute beast. Yeah. And it just goes to show like how you can be so different. And I feel like, do you feel like you almost need that blinkers war mode on? Or do you feel like you can be a character on the table and still perform? I, I would love to be a character on the table. I've mm -hmm. always thought that over the years. Like I'd love to show more of my personality if World Snooker and TV and all that allows. Do you know, mm -hmm. I would love to. But at the same time, I've felt that if I've if I've done it a bit too much or I maybe think about doing that a bit too much, it may affect me focus a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that's just, yeah, I need that sort of split personality to an extent. Obviously, in the past, I've, had, I've done daft things like that back hawk to me hair and stuff and silly uh -huh. hairstyles and that's bits of me personality coming out and it it didn't necessarily put us off but i thought if i go much further with this and everyone starts making a bigger <laughs> hype about it than maybe what it is Aye. i'll the focus will start coming away from me as a snooker player and more as a daft character you know and i can be a daft character but i'd rather save that for my personal life than my snooker life a yeah. bit more i think because it, be, it, be, it can quickly become like darts can't it when you start going on like that yeah it, so, i just feel that i like to be as um, as boring and monotone as you can when it comes to the snooker side of it, because mm -hmm. that's how I feel I best play. Yeah. So if I'm gonna produce my best results that way, I'd rather stick to that somewhat. Yeah. So you're not wearing your heels for the world. Again, as I say, there's little bits will come out here and there. I, I mean, I wear shiny shoes. Um, uh, as I say, I've had daft hairstyles. I've got a funky back on my waistcoat at the moment. You know, I'll do little things that aren't going to affect us. But if it gets too silly, that's not that's not the area I want to go down. I want to keep it real. Do you think, for me, with snooker, and how old compared to other sports, if you look at someone like box, like boxing, for instance, or football, or any, most of the sports, the it's personality based. A lot of it, so you become more marketable when you when you are that character. With snooker, it's very different. I feel like, as much as I love the sport, I feel like it's a very boring sport socially. Yeah. So even when I've been to different tournaments and stuff and stayed in hotels and stuff, you see, sort of play, it's very clicky and people didn't talk to certain people yeah. and stuff like that. And I feel like a lot of fans won't know that. They'll just think Gary's best mates were Ronnie off the table because yeah, yeah. they're both, you know. But really, I, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen certain players literally sit two tables away from the other, not say a word. Yeah. And I'm like, you're both in the same discipline. How can you not even 
share a drink or some food or something when you've both got three hours down to yeah. downtime. Like, are you like that? Do you try and stay away from the players? And the reason I brought Slesser up earlier was because obviously when you beat him last, I imagined when you effectively stopped where he was going in his career at that particular time, I feel like, is there any kind of dodgy atmosphere after that? Or is it like, is it just banter? Well, m- First of all, like me, me as a person, like I'm a bit of both, and as I say, because more me other bit of my personality at the snooker is more a bit more serious. I still, and there's other players do as well, loads obviously who still go up to people, have a drink, have a chat. We do it all the time, you know. If we've lost games, we'll meet up for drinks in the pub later on. We'll go out for food with certain players and stuff. You're right. You do have your own little cliques, more mm-hmm. like your own, you know, little groups of friends who you're used to practicing with or you're yeah. used to seeing more than others. But everybody knows each other in the snooker family as well. Do you know what I mean? And it's not it's rare you'll get people not speak to anyone else. We'll always have a bit of a chat and stuff. So it's probably not as bad as you think. But you do see it, obviously, people sitting there and maybe a table or two away, as you say, and not saying anything. And it may just be because they're in a bit of a game mode at that time and they don't really want to say anything to anyone. Um, the other part of it, obviously, as you say, there, like with Sless, um, there's another story to all that where it did actually, if it, something's affected him recently because... And I'll I'll just say it. He, he's not speaking to us. Um, mm-hmm. He thinks he thinks I cheated against him in in the Scottish last year. Bloody hell! Um, there was a there was a controversy over whether it was a push shot or not on mm-hmm. a red. Mm-hmm. Um, my side was it not in a million years. The cue ball reacted the way it should react on the shot, and it was absolutely fine. Um, there's video footage from people like Nick Barrow who've done videos of a similar shot from Luca Brassell actually a few years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. on the other side and. He's actually slow mode it all down and explained to people of Luca's shot why it wasn't a push and what it would be if it was. He's got a whole video but footage sh- in that. And- surely from that though, Gary, the the whole where the decision went can't be swayed yeah. because of that one. Whether I know you didn't, but let's say yeah. you did cheat, mm-hmm. for instance. Does that? I mean, I I don't want to really go into that, but I feel like is is that just someone you know toys up the problem? Well, I, I wasn't I wasn't going to go into it any yeah, further, yeah. No, other than just explain that. There was a controversy over the shot. That's what happened. That's the way I feel. Mm-hmm. He feels a different way. And as you were saying, like, you know, how does it feel when you're beating Slesser and stuff like that? So I was basically just trying to answer the question and say, well, to me, everything's fine. Everything's, yeah, yeah, you know, to well, me, it's a game of snooker. I won that one. If he'd have won that one, I was ready to shake his hand and go, best of luck, hope you win the tournament. Yeah, it's a bit of an old branch in it, like, ultimately. Yeah, like. but it, it hasn't panned out that way, unfortunately. It's mm-hmm. a massive shame because mm-hmm. we've been friends for so long, but... Yeah, um, as I say, massive shame. Just, just hope one day we can get to a point where we're we're talking again. Yeah. While we're on an absolute downer in this podcast, <laughs> I want to talk about. Can you draw upon your darkest time? Oh, in God, recent I've years, Gary. Because uh, a lot. I mean, a lot of the stuff. Again, like I said at the start of the interview, a lot of the things I'm seeing. You're very upbeat. You seem more calm. You honestly, you seem like a different lad. It's weird. Right. It, it's just watching you. Not. Not knowing you anymore yeah. or anything like that, just just watching you. Right. Is there any times recent that no one knows about where you've been like? I, oh, I not can't. that no one knows about, but I would say the one that it springs to mind the most was, and it was touched on a few years ago, was when we were getting the whole house extension done and all that kind of thing. I went through a really bad period then, where it actually got to the point where, and this isn't my character. I admitted that I had some kind of depression, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that's not me. That's like I'm the first to call somebody out on just basically saying they've got this and they've got that when they're just having a bad day. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I was having a very bad couple of years. What was what were the signs? Again, for anyone watching where they, was, they could be I, gone through I was actually similar. losing weight. And I'm a skinny lad anyway. I was losing weight. Um, I was I was just not the same character at all. I was very sort of quiet. And my missus will tell you. Obviously, yeah. she knows us better than most. And um, yeah, she'll tell you I was losing weight. I was just quiet all the time wasn't the same bubbly self as I would normally be. I was constantly trying to make sure everything was fine and sorted and fixed and just running around like a blue arse fly. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just like, just just totally, totally different to what my normal character would be. And I had to sort of snap out of it to an extent. And once the stuff with the house was all sorted and I could feel myself starting to slowly come round to just being more me again. And yeah, it was a couple of years that were pretty dreadful to be did honest, you, did, but it's gone now. Did you combat that with anything in particular or did was it a case of just time? time yeah i'm not a fan of like medications and stuff like that i'm not a believer in like taking stuff that yes i know it helps people i know it's 
know it's there for a reason and it's good for people who really, really need it. But again, get probably me just being me, not thinking it was as serious as what it is. And mm-hmm. I do know I had some depression, definitely, but mm-hmm. I wasn't feeling the need to take medication for it or anything like that. It was just more try and change my mental state, try and do the things that you do as a person to try and just help yourself, really. Yeah. It's so funny you say that, Gary, about doing your house up and stuff because it arcs back to when I was when I was renovating a house. Mm-hmm. My little one was born a few months early, so she was in hospital a lot. Yeah. And I remember I was doing the house up, we were literally knocking walls through, just doing everything to this house. Then I was going to the hospital every night and then nipping through the day and then I was doing my business. And yeah. I remember, genuinely, mate, I can't remember a lot of that. Right. And I don't know if it was, I mean, obviously I, I didn't, I wasn't classed as depressed. I didn't see anyone about it. Yeah. But me and me and our last even now we're talking about things and we can't even remember. It's like this autopilot mode. And I feel like again, I want to try and help someone listening and watching. And if they feel like they're going through something like that where something's just not right or yeah. they're losing weight's a bloody great indicator yeah, of something yeah. going wrong. But it's a case of you might not even be able to put your finger on it, but something still might not be right. Yeah, and yeah. it's often a case because I've spoken to a lot of people now who've who've dealt with things like this, and it's 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 a very similar pattern. I, I can't very, even remember. I that felt time very though. very similar, like mm-hmm. the sort of autopilot mode where I, I look back on it and I go, I know it was a massive chunk of my life. Can't remember a lot about it. I remember all the stuff I had to try and go through, but I actually physically remembering, you know. Like, Proper right. memories of stuff. I can't really remember too much of it. You sort of probably shut it off. I think you shut it away mechanism, somewhere. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you end up in autopilot, and as you say, you just get to a point where you're like, "What's going on here? Like, this isn't me at all." And that, that's the that's the clincher when you go, "Look, this isn't me. This isn't what I normally am like." There's definitely something wrong here. Just say it. Just say it. And I did. I'm an honest and real person, as I've said. I mm-hmm. just said to I said to the missus and I said to my mates, I goes. You feel a bit embarrassed being my personality because, and I don't get embarrassed neither, by the way, if anything, really at all. Mate, I've seen you dancing on Facebook. Yeah. I know you don't so I don't really get embarrassed, but I was a bit embarrassed to try and say to somebody, I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. Not Felt weak? No, not that I even felt weak. Because again, I, I, I don't get embarrassed. If I, if I truly feel something, I'll just tell you. I'm not bothered how people perceive us or anything like that. It was more a slight embarrassment of, I'm telling you I feel depressed, but you might not even believe that I'm telling you the truth because I might just be talking rubbish and I know I'm not. I know I'm telling you this because, and you should know I'm telling you this because I'm an honest person and I really feel it. If I'm telling you this, you know it's right, basically. So you you do, you just feel that natural bit of embarrassment as to I'm telling you because it's actually happening and you might not believe us. That's the best way to be, though, that, that being transparent, being honest, because, for instance, I've used this analogy before. If, for me, right, if I don't want to do something, yeah, I say no. But when I do, because people get the hump, why do you not want to do this? Why do you not want to come out with us? Why do you not want to go there? But if I say yes, you know I mean it. Yeah. And I think the more we can get good at saying no to things, Mm -hmm. the better we can become as people, whether it is mental health, depression, whatever it is, the more you can be as honest and upfront when something is gone wrong, someone's going to listen to you. Definitely. And that's the way I try to be. As I say, like if if someone asks me if I want to go out or do anything, I'll go, no, can't, doing this or no, don't want to. Some people have a massive problem with just saying, no, I don't want to. Yeah. Oh, why not? Because I don't. Um, if I had a real reason in my head, I'd tell you, but I just don't fancy it. Yeah, but they have to come up with some enough. excuse with this, that, and the other, and you're like, I think it's because we're, yeah, you know I I mean? we're all people pleasers deep down, though. So yeah. we don't want to just say no because it sounds rude. There's a we bit want to come that, up yeah. with a, do you know what I mean? I can't Use the funeral card again. <laughs> I can't be bothered with it. I'd rather just tell somebody, yeah. look, not for me. It's just no, not for me, understandable. and that should be enough for you. We crack on. You'll know, when I want to do something, you'll 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 know straight away. It's fine. On a brighter note, Gary, um, <laughs> we you mentioned earlier on about annoying questions. Yeah, you said that the one I asked you was a bit boring. The snooker cliche. Is there questions. any other boring questions? That yeah, the you snooker. Hear? Well, the snook, apart from the snooker, you mean? Aye. Uh, is anything you hear being asked? Uh, no, it is literally. As I say, I'm, I'm I quite like socialising. I'm, you know, that's one of my hobbies is to go out drinking with my mates and stuff, you know, and socialising and speaking to people as long as it's not about the same stuff I do every day. So other questions, other other stuff, I'm actually, as you can probably tell we're doing these, I talk and I talk and I talk and I just like, I'll talk about anything with anyone and having, a, I'll, I'll have a point of view on anything unless I know nothing about it and then I'm, you know, I feel I'm sensible enough to say I know nothing about that so I'm not going to give you any opinions because I wouldn't have a clue you know politics isn't a strong point for me Mm. I don't dare try and even talk to people about the intricacies of parties and 
left wing, right wing, and all that. I want to hit with you some quick fire questions. Do you know what I mean, though? So I'm, I'm, I'll happily just go. Ah, I, I, I know where you're coming from. I don't know myself, not my area. I'm happy just to go. I'll not talk about stuff that I don't know anything about. And I think some people can learn from that as well. Don't talk about things you don't know anything about. But by all means, talk about everything else. Enjoy yourself. Have your opinions on stuff. And I'm happy to do all that and chat with people about anything, really, just as long as it's not the same old boring snooker questions. And this yeah. is what I absolutely <laughs> love doing the podcast for, because I feel right. like we don't get to just drill into snooker. We talk about people. We actually talk about real people with real lives. And again, this is why I feel like snooker's not doing enough of this type of stuff. It's always... Just, if I type in Gary Wilson, I'm going to say snooker all day. Yeah. But I want to see... You, you rig I want to see your Wilson. game and set up I yeah. want I was Gary Wilson <laughs> yeah. I want to see the dancing in the pub videos the, the, you know what I mean that's what you want I feel like that's what people buy into when they get to know you yeah off the top of my head macking this up totally wasn't supposed to put this in the interview right. um, quick fire round alright okay <laughs> yeah. best venue uh, Crucible Pepsi or Coke Coke most annoying snooker player uh, Dominic Dale why not in a bad way. I love him, but he's really annoying. He's quirks. I, I love him, Dom. I love you. <laughs> which, which he sings and that and all, doesn't he? That's annoying. Uh, <laughs> Opera singing all the which, time. What's he doing? Which player surprised you when you met them? Uh, poor Ronnie, probably. Yeah, in a good way or bad? Good way. Yeah. Yeah. So what? What did you think? What was your perception? Nice bloke. As mm. I say, I feel I can relate to him. Understand. Did you think he'd be a uh, well, I thought he might be a little bit more, yeah, for want of a better phrase, up his own arse. Yeah. Like you would naturally think about certain people, maybe, but I know as well that would be wrong for us to even think that, and I never judge people straight away. I always try and take them at face value and make my own mind up about them, and I thought he was a sound bloke, still do. And yeah, get on well with him now. One thing nobody knows about you? Um, phew, Nobody knows. I don't know. I'm quite an open book. Um, I'd have to have a think about that. See, yeah. Don't biggest know. biggest regret. Regret. Didn't give us the cliche answer. Uh, again, I I, I'm not really one for regrets because once <laughs> you've done it, you've I done it, it, haven't you? So, um, <laughs> these are hard. These these are hard questions. Okay. I, I don't have many regrets, and I don't really best. Yeah. Career highlight. Career highlight. That would have to be... Now I'm going to put two there because I, ha- I can't pick one. It would be winning the first ranking title, the Scottish, mm-hmm. but and being involved in the semi-final of the World Championships as well. Who do you think the toughest player is? Who could have a scrap? Oh, uh... I think I think Stephen Maguire could have a good scrap. Like, uh, <laughs> do you uh, do you know this or n- no? I don't know it, you know, firsthand. But I uh, the, the rumours go around that he can handle himself. Like, I uh, so I've yeah. always thought uh, Matt Selt. Really? Uh, right. Okay. You, right. He just looks like the type of blood I wouldn't want to. Uh, uh, some sort of like tenacious terrier in there. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> some, or Lisowski. I feel like he's like a bit of a. Uh, I reckon right, because he, he goes to the gym a bit and he could probably handle himself just a bit so. of taekwondo or something eh? <laughs> which player do you like the least uh, like the least uh, nobody currently but I'm going to say Andres Petrov if you're listening and that was that was obviously for an incident a while ago we've since had a chat made up everything's absolutely fine Um I'll I'll say I didn't respect what happened at the time. I still believe to an extent what I was saying was true. Mm-hmm. That going to the toilet every frame is not necessary and it's not part of your mind. Yeah, human yeah, yeah, yeah. needs. It was literally in look, you can feel you're entitled to do what you want to do if it's within the rules to an extent. Go to the toilet, try and break up play, try and try and do what you want. It's not going to affect us, it's not going to bother us. What's going to bother us is the fact that you're trying and there's no need for it. So I still don't agree with the philosophy philosophy at all. At the same time, as I say, we've had a chat. He's a nice kid. I don't think he means any harm by it at all. And yeah, we're absolutely fine. But at the time, it was Andrus. I can't really think of anyone that I don't like now, though. Right, last one. Snog Murray Pie. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> John... Snooker players. <laughs> <laughs> John Barrett. Uh, well, so there's going to be three, and I've got to pick snog, marry, or pie. Aye. Different, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So John Parrot. Right. 
Jimmy White. And John Parrott, Jimmy White. And Ronnie. And Ronnie. Um, and I need a reason for each. I think I'd marry Ronnie because I think we're on a similar wavelength and I think we'd, we'd probably get on really well. We wouldn't have any bad disagreements and if we did, we'd, we'd probably handle them quite similar. We'd get on really well, I think. So we could, we could last a lot of years together. Uh, so Snog and Pie, John Parrott and Jimmy White. <laughs> Are you I, think, on I think I'll pie Jimmy White because I think he's had enough action over the years. He doesn't need any more from me. <laughs> And snog John, because, I mean, look at the hairline on the guy. He's still got it going, hasn't he? <laughs> Mind the Scouser accent might get on me nerves. I so, imagine, imagine yeah. you and John Parrott Netflix and chilling like <laughs> <laughs> Gary, cheers for your time, mate. Thanks well, a lot, mate. Appreciate it. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. So you've made it to the end of the episode. Fair play. If you want to watch more episodes like this, click here.